As the good Earth dances along its orbital path, progressing through time and space, she stubbornly clings onto her greatest asset, the sun. The attraction is a rule, but benefits in this universe are never a given. Darkness is a constant in the expanse of space. But fortunately for life here, our sun predictably blankets the surface of the Earth with radiant warming light 365 days a year. It's easy for us to ignore the ever-present dark and to be unaware of the worlds that exist in perpetual night. But the light of our sun reminds us of our good fortune by day revealing the shadows which pervade in the nooks and crannies that lie below us. There is a set of adventurers who spend much of their time exploring the recesses of our Earth's crust. They are known as cavers and participate in the sport of spelunking. But don't call them spelunkers, for that's what they call the amateurs. For our purposes, however, spelunking is simply the act of cave exploration, and the word is derived from Latin, borrowed from the Greeks, and transformed from its ancestry to the Middle English word spelunk, meaning cave. Stick an ers on it, and it means cavers, but I will try not to upset anyone. In the 1880s, a Frenchman and avid caver named Edouard Martel first used an official derivative of the term. He started a gentleman's caving club and called it the Société des Spéléologies. Some 80 years later, another Frenchman and caver would test his mind and his limits at the bottom of a spelunk. Michel Sif grew up exploring caves. He was born in Nice, in France, on the shores of the Mediterranean. And as a youth, he fell in love with geology and joined the French Academy of Sciences, a prodigious society dating back to 1666. There he was tutored by Jacques Bercourt, a decorated French naturalist, oceanographer, and nonconformist. Jacques' later trait must have rubbed off on young Michel, for at the age of 22, he decided to do something ridiculous in the name of science. At the time, NASA and the Soviet space program were at a dead heat in the race to reach the moon. Humanity's experience in the dark void of space was limited and researchers did not know how well the conditions of space would affect man and his mind. There were many critical questions to be answered. So influenced by the space race and charged with personal ambition, in 1962, Michel decided to spend two months alone, 110 meters below the surface, in a frozen cave called the Scarison Abyss. It was the race, he later told Spelio magazine. Gagarin had left in 1961. Me, it was 1962, and nothing was known about human behavior outside the terrestrial nictamural rhythm, the terrestrial day-night rhythm. Nictamural rhythms are also referred to as circadian rhythms. And according to the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, are physical, mental, and behavioral changes that follow a daily cycle. They respond primarily to light and darkness in an organism's environment. Sleeping at night and being awake during the day is an example of a light-related circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythms are found in most living things, including animals, plants, and many tiny microbes. The study of circadian rhythms is called chronobiology. Michel Sif found his niche, and along with speleologist, and geologist, he added chronobiologist to his resume. So in 1962, Michel descended into the abyss alone, without a clock or any means of telling time. This was intentional. He was there to study man's circadian rhythm. 
and the psychological effect of prolonged solitude for two months. Knowing the date or the time would have nullified the whole experiment, poisoning the results. He had pitched his tent next to an underground glacier in a confined chamber. It goes without saying that it was cold and the humidity logged in at 98%. He brought with him a telephone, but he had given strict instructions that nobody was to call him or tell him the time. He reported to the surface on a regular basis to let people know he was still alive and to give his estimations of the date and time. Physically, the ordeal was exhausting. The extreme cold was a constant burden, and it was difficult to move about without great effort. But he stuck it out. Psychologically, he was strong. His youthful energies aided his steadfast resolve, and he remained there in that dark world until his comrades told him that time was up. But Michel was surprised. He did not think that two months had already passed. In his mind, time had moved slowly, but by the clock, time had moved much faster than he perceived it. Michel believed that it was August 20th, but it was September the 14th. Michel was behind the clock by 25 days. It was an astonishing result and proved once again that time flies when you're having fun. But Michel did not have fun on his ascent. The conditions and lack of exercise had weakened him, and he struggled to slither his way up through the tight fissures and steep shafts, but his fellow cavers aided him and urged him on. Michel eventually emerged from the dark to greet the sun for the first time in 63 days, exhausted and pale. He looked much like an astronaut, returning to Earth after a long stay in space. NASA had realized the value of his condition and paid for the mathematical results he had produced to be quantified and analyzed. Soviet cosmonauts Yuri Gagarin and Valentin Lebedev also took note and quoted Mr. Seif in their book on psychology and space. The adventure was a success and funding began to pour in. The main takeaway from this first experiment was that Michel's circadian rhythms had carried on despite the dark and isolation. His days followed a pattern of 24 and a half hours, just slightly longer than our earthly day. This was the first hint that human beings had a built-in clock somewhere deep in their minds. It was as if we all carried with us an inner sun. More cave isolation experiments were performed and more data collected. There was value in cracking the circadian code. Space agencies and militaries alike had profound interest in reducing aeronautical accidents due to mental and physical fatigue. Could this data be utilized to boost performance? Could man's internal clock be tweaked through mental training, modified sleep patterns, or psychostimulants to produce a super pilot, a better astronaut, or a soldier who could fight on for hours on end? For the next 10 years, Michel was a busy man. And then he hit the jackpot, or so he thought. NASA and the French military had both approached him to do another, but longer and more ambitious self-induced cave isolation. This time Michel found himself in Texas, aux états unis near San Antonio. Here he was destined to spend 205 days in Midnight Cave, an appropriately named subterranean labyrinth. Here he stayed in perpetual night, strapped up with sensors, a rectal probe, cardiographic electrodes, and attached to a 10 meter long umbilical cord. While sleeping, Michel would wear electrodes on his head and face to monitor his brain waves and REM patterns. During his waking periods, he would eat food provided by NASA, the same which the Apollo 16 astronauts ate. Michel later joked that I swallowed 1 million euros in six months. NASA also provided him with a stationary bicycle so that he could work up a sweat once in a while. Michel claims that his physical condition was much better in Texas than his time in the Scarison Abyss. The cave was warmer, he had better equipment, and the bike to help keep him fit. 
But as time elapsed and he lost all track of it, his mental condition began to decline. Two months had passed, whether he knew it or not, and the time came and went. But Michel had no perception of it. To him, time was his greatest adversary, and he was running out of ways to fight it. On the 79th day of seclusion, his record player broke down. The humidity was attacking his equipment, and his precious books and magazines, which had helped keep him sane, began to crumble. With no outlet in whom to vent his frustrations, he started to question himself, his profession, his life choices, and pondered suicide. But he found solace in a mouse who was nibbling on his food supplies. He monitored its activities with great interest and began to regain connection with the world. But when he tried to capture his furry friend with a casserole dish, he misjudged his attempt and crushed the poor creature, killing it. He then wrote in his journal that desolation overwhelms me. And from that moment, I lived the last four months as a prisoner. I put my hands behind my back. I walked. I went back and forth on my three meter platform. It was hell. A lesser man would have quit. Dread and despair have pushed many towards the cliff, but Michel did not jump and showed steadfast resolve and commitment to his colleagues and financiers. He suffered through the last days in an uninterrupted melancholy, but his willpower was unbroken, and he eventually emerged on July 9, 1972, to an enthusiastic crowd of journalists, fellow scientists, and cavers. He was now a world-renowned researcher. Every morning, here on the good earth, the sun predictably graces us with its radiant presence. Her rising frees us from the demons of the darkness, real or self-invented, so as to give light and provide clarity to our introspective minds. She gives us a perception of the passage of time and meters our daily regimens, providing us with confidence and comfort as we pursue our individual efforts. But take away the cycle of day and night, and the sun is but one of infinite light bulbs hanging in the cavernous fabric of space-time. As future travelers push out into the far reaches, there is no knowing how they will react to the dark. So until then, we must rely on the explorers who brave the unknown with gritted teeth and stern perseverance, facing down demons alone as they try to find their own inner sun.